right, everyone. I am humbly glad to welcome you back to whether it's your first, second, fifth, tenth, or sixty-second <laughs> trip to our little show here. Thank you for downloading this week's episode of the Top Five Podcast, where my co-hosts and I discuss all things popular culture. We share our very at sometimes intense opinions and we laugh a lot. And Annie, what else do we do on this show? Good Lord. We, we, we curse a lot. We do curse a lot. And for that, we do not apologize. Yeah. Um, More laughing than crying. This is, this is for sure. That is true. Yeah. 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 Not so much crying. I don't think we've ever cried on the show. Have oh, we? I did. You yeah. Did. Well, anyway, we have a great time in case you forgot or it's your first time here. My name is Chris McPeak, and I do this show mostly with my very bestest friend and youngest sister, Annie Pruitt. Hello there, Annie Pruitt. Hello there, big sister. And how are you on this fine recording Saturday? You know, I am okay. I, yeah, I'm just okay today. (laughs) You have had a pretty busy few weeks, a a whirlwind of stuff. Yes, I have, but it's all good. It's all good. And we're moving on. And we- what I can say for myself is that it is cooling down here in the Los Angeles area. Although I would not be surprised if we got another round of the heat before before it starts to cool down for real. Mm-hmm. And I also will say I turned off the air conditioner two days ago. So I don't know if we'll be turning it back on or if that's the end of that. But yeah, because, you know, all things pop culture, and that includes the weather. What the fuck? I don't know. Exactly. Hang on. My ear is popping, and I need to equalize. So hang on one second. Okay. We may or may not edit that out. Okay. So, Annie, why don't you tell all of our delightful, beautiful listeners what the hell we are going to discuss today? Okay. So first, we're going to, well, we're, we're going to do sports movies today. So our top five sports movies, and we have some kind of ground rules, I guess. These may, these don't have to be like, they could be at multiple categories. They can cross into other, you know, they could be drama. They could be comedy, just general sports overall. Yeah. General sports where, yes, what's happening in said movie is the telling or the experiencing of some competition game. Whether it be a team sport or an individual sport, all of the things. And yeah. And, you know, there's no rule that says you have to cover any specific sports. But yeah, we're just going to kind of make our way through this. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, it's fun. And we like sports movies. They're inspirational. They're exciting. Yeah. All of the things. All of the things. All of the things. All righty. Well, how about I go ahead and start us off? Wonderful. Okay, so surprisingly that this is not my number one sports movie, because it may very well be a lot of people's number one sports movies, sports movie, but I am going with the original first 1976 Boxing Tale Rocky that was written by and stars Sylvester Stallone and that took home among all the now, okay, let me sidebar for a second. 1976 was an incredible year for film. And any of the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture could have, you know, taken the, the top spot and nobody would have argued that. But Rocky, a, a first time screenplay effort for a essentially nobody ever heard of this person, Sylvester mm-hmm. Stallone. And it is without a doubt, like, I mean, if you are not standing up cheering, and 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 pumping your fists and waving your arms around by the time this movie's over or bawling like a, a little baby it is it's just ha- it has so much heart in it and and it's a little funny and it's also they kind of weave in the sweet like oh rocky gets a girlfriend and and all of those things so it's it's very endearing it's exciting sylvester stallone you know <laughs> Say what you want about good old Sly. If he did nothing else the rest of his life, like he could have just stood on this laurel and everybody would have been fine. Because now we're going to get into, I don't want to get into Rocky 2, 3, 4, 5 and, and on the rest, which I enjoy all of them, but nothing beats the original 1976 Rocky. Okay. I, I made a small change to my list 
So Rocky one is actually not my favorite Rocky movie. So it was actually Rocky two was my favorite. Rocky well, okay. Movie. Because that's the one that gets me crying at the very end more. So, I mean, like, I just ball like a baby. And especially when he thinks he's going to lose his, his wife and, you know, and, you know, doesn't want to see his child until, you know, until his, until Adrian comes out of her coma. And well, touche, little yeah. sister, that is a very, very good point. So it, you see more of, the, I th you know, you see the fighter in Rocky, but then you see like the, the, a little more of his humanity. The husband, it, the father. It, yeah. Now it's not all about him anymore, but that's, I would say like as a, as a kid growing up, I probably watched Rocky two twice as many times as I watched the first one, but it was. It was kind of like you had to kind of watch them together because it seemed like one movie because and that's, you know, the nature of Rocky because there was it was seamless. It literally went from scene to scene. Yeah, um, you're right. You're right. There's no, you know, six months later. It's yeah. Same night. Yeah. So but uh, yeah. And then, you know, I enjoyed three and four because I, I liked this, the Rocky stories. But Rocky two of all the Rocky movies is my favorite and it was on my, you know, so yeah. So my number five, I'm going to go with Rocky two from 1979. Beautiful. There you go. Yeah. Oh, was it 79? Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's nuts. That's just seems like so long away <laughs> from yeah. the original one, but that's fine too. A hey, magnificent. Okay. Okay. So number four to me, right? Right. Hang on. Let me do one more thing. Okay, my number uh, wrestling film featuring Matthew Modine, Linda Fiorentino, Ronnie Cox, and the movie is Vision Quest. What can you say about this movie? First of all, if you don't know diddly poo about wrestling, you're going to learn quite a bit. And if you want to get into the mix of, you know, somebody literally throwing every part of their heart and soul and and blood and guts and all of the things into trying to achieve this one thing before finishing high school and going out into the world. You might say like, well, this is so dumb. You're sacrificing the needs of the team for yourself and who does that and this, that and the other thing. But in terms of the concept of Vision Quest, which our dear friend, Jay, <laughs> what's Jake's last name in 16 Candles? Karen. I don't even remember. Yeah. So the guy that, that plays Jake in 16 Candles is Loudon Swain's buddy in Vision Quest. And actually, it's his original slot in the wrestling that Loudon chooses to take over in order to wrestle off at 165 with Shoot, who is a monster in the wrestling high school world. And Loudon just wants to take on this person to see if he can. He starts the movie wrestling off, I want to say, one. 185 and drops two weight classes a shit ton of weight oh and along the way meets an older woman who you know is mysterious and exciting and sassy and they have a a, a legitimate fling that's that's beautiful and yeah i'm not going to tell you how it ends but it's quite a it is quite a vision quest it is quite a a process that that he goes through and not only learning a lot about what it means to become a man that's in air quotes but his the process and and the people that he's with along the way and yeah the the triumph that he receives at the end is is quite different because it's not just a a wrestling match that was won it was at the capstone of a high school career it was the attainment of the you know unachievable goal and and who doesn't want to celebrate that? Plus, it is a fucking kick-ass soundtrack. Some of the greatest yeah. songs to come out of the 1980s, par bar none. And a small little, you know, movie debut by a certain material girl who would become, you know, Madonna. Well, she was Madonna, what can I say? But Crazy For You, you know, that's, yeah. What, what else can I say? Number four, you, Vision Quest, 1986. That may or may not appear on my list. It's Okay. But it's not number four. Okay. okay. <laughs> so my number four is actually a, another wrestling movie. It is Foxcatcher from 2014. Oh, Annie, good call. So the re I love this movie for so many reasons. One, it's based on the true story of DuPont, the DuPont family, John DuPont, and his inevitable demise, you know, murdering one of an Olympic wrestler who's yeah. played by 
slow. But for one, it's the first time I saw Steve Carell step outside of Steve Carell. Yes. And what a ridiculously amazing performance. Both he and Ruff, Mark Ruffalo were nominated for Academy Awards for it. You know, it didn't yes. win. But, and I love, like, Mark Ruffalo, he's in, like, my top five favorite actors right now. I, he's, he can't, he can do no wrong. I agree. But this movie turned my, turned me around on Channing Tatum. I thought he was just a, you know, I thought he was a, a pretty face and a good dancer, but this kid can act. And, oh my God, what yes. a, and it's, it's, it's grueling. It's, it is so sad, you know, as you watch what's happening to him being manipulated by, you know, this DuPont guy and then, and inevitably the, the nut, you know, him going so nuts and then killing the, the, you know, Channing Tatum's brother, Mark Ruffalo's character brothers. So I love wrestling movies because that's, it's a uh, kind of like for, you know, the same for, for the same reason for Vis vision quest, because it's you and one, one person, and, and, and you're battling, you know, it's in your head, it's, it's your fight. It's your yeah. one fight. You may be a part of a wrestling team, but, but then also just the story behind what's happening with these three, with these three people and how DuPont just completely destroyed these lives. So it's, yeah. it's, it's just it's such a good movie. So yeah, number four, Fox Catcher from 2014. Good, very good call. And I will say that I... I watched the documentary about that film, which I think is a Netflix movie, before I watched the narrative film. And so I, I came into that whole thing with a different a different mindset because, you know, I had watched the, you know, scenes of the real the real peeps and whatnot. But I I completely agree with you about Channing Tatum, although you can go back and see. A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. If you have not seen that movie, that is a fantastic movie. Shia LaBeouf, Robert Downey Jr., Channing Tatum, a few others. It's it's written by Dito something, the guy that the movie is about. It's written by him. But anyway, yeah, Vachka, that's a fantastic. Good call, Annie. I love it. My ear just will not stop popping. Okay, I'm on number three. Okay. This is a football movie, and so we have discussed this movie in a previous show, and I guess it's on this list because it is my favorite football movie ever. So I'm going with the Keanu Reeves, Gene Hackman, and a wide variety of other delightful acting talents, The Replacements, which is about a fictional team in a period where football players are going on strike. And the, the team bringing in a bunch of replacement players to try and finish the season and, you know, get through all the, the mess of it all. It's an interesting, it's interesting to see the concept of, you know, a strike being played on screen. And I'm thinking about that right now only because striking is apparently quite the popular thing right now between the writers and the actors and the auto workers. And I also heard that Kaiser Permanente was going on strike. But but nonetheless, you get to kind of see the the insides of that and and what that feels like. But what I love most about this movie is how these replacement players who are brought in, like, they could care less that there's a strike going on. Some of them just want to live out their, their fantasies of being able to play professional football. And for the lead character, yeah. the delightful Shane Falco, who had a terrible sugar bowl back <laughs> in the day and kind of fell off the face of the earth, it is an opportunity for absolute redemption. And yeah. he fills it all up when he says, let's see. Chicks dig scars, pain heals, glory lasts forever. I think I got that in the wrong order, but I mean, that's life, right? So yeah. this is such a happy, fun movie and quite silly too. Orlando, what's his name? Blue. As the, the wide receiver is just a card. And John Favreau as the, the MP cop defensive, whatever he is, defensive back. Hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then, and, and, you know, there's a little love story in there too. It's not quite as big a deal as the rest of the story, but you know, you're going to have Keanu Reeves without someone for him to make out with. That's not going to happen. So anyway, okay. number three, the replacements. Okay. I'm totally changing my list. Cause I don't want us to have so much overlap. Oh, Annie. <laughs> okay. But this actually was my original number three from 1996. I'm going with a golf movie, but 10 cups. 
So you've got Kevin is probably in my top. Like I love Kevin Costner. He is not a great actor, but he was really he he nailed this role. The washed up golf pro works at a driving range, and then he meets Rene Russo, this psychiatrist, psychologist, psychiatrist. What is she? One or the other. And he's nuts for her. He goes bananas for for, for Rene Russo. And she's a hot mess too. <laughs> but somehow, somehow it ends up that Roy Tin Cup McAvoy gets his shit together and goes to try to qualify, gets into the U.S., qualifies for the U.S. Open. And what does he do? He, he plays his heart out and gets to the, the final hole and there's this shot that he know he, he knows he can make it and and he loses his shit <laughs> he just loses it and he keeps yeah, he does ball after ball after ball and it's a great line i wish i could remember exactly how it goes but Rene Ru- he hits a hole in one finally it's his last ball and he hits a hole in one on the last hole of the u.s open and he and Rene russo you know going up to him just like yes yeah, you did it and and she says, you know, you wanted to be legendary. Nobody's going to remember, you know, when somebody, you know, dropped for par. Everybody's going to remember the 12. <laughs> Everybody's remember that when you shot a 12 on the last hole of the Open. It's immortal. That's what it, it, well, it, so I'm sorry. I'm getting, I'm getting like misty about it. It's so, <laughs> it is absolutely so cute because it's finally, it's not about, the, it's not about, winning the u.s open it, it's about you know finding who you are and who he is is the guy that can hit a hole in one on mm-hmm. the hole of the u.s open he knew he could do it so by god he did it and of course he ends up with uh renee gets the girl in the end and i i just love it and uh, you know and his best friend played by cheech marin gets his girl and and all is well in, in the world so it's a it's a great it's it's an adorable romantic comedy, but it's also for people that appreciate golf and what it means to you know it's all it's a head game, it's one hundred percent a head game. So yeah. I think it really hits that. So that's my number three. Yeah, Tip- I could I could not agree more. That is for real. I struggled with this movie a little bit because, like, oh. and Ron Shelton, he the the writer and the director of this film. I sometimes feel, and it takes me a while, I guess, to tack on to his, his storytelling pace, I guess. Because I felt mm-hmm. the same way about Bull Durham the first few times I saw Bull Durham. But Bull Durham now is one of my my favorite baseball movies. It is the best quintessential baseball movie in my mind. But so I always feel like he could have ended the movie a little bit earlier than he did. But then, of course, I changed my mind. And I'm like, oh, this is the best thing ever. But and Tin Cup, it winds up being a a storytelling plot point uh, in the series Billions, which I'm totally going down a Billions rabbit hole right now because they are. Well, we'll talk about that in another show. So speaking of Tin Cup. And Kevin Costner and Ron Shelton. That takes me to my number two, which is that baseball movie, Bull Durham. And again, this is a film that's going to be on another list. There, I just gave my number one away for when we talk about baseball movies. But I love this movie so much because it it delves into, and it's not even about, perf- well, it's about a ball, minor league baseball, and all of the the silly little things that that make up the culture, the inside culture of baseball, the superstitions, you know, you don't fuck with a winning streak. And he wore garters the the whole time uh, that he was pitching because it made him feel closer to Annie. And, and he, you know, this is why I'm winning is because I'm wearing garters or I want you to breathe through your eyelids, that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's wacky and it's silly. And then you have the part of, here's this one woman who, teaches English at a junior college who is, you know, having an affair with a ball player every single summer, but somehow that ball player goes on to do amazing, great things as it happens with Evie Calvin Nuke Lalouche, who gets called up to the majors at the end of the movie. It's the film that brought Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins together. Although I understand they're not together anymore. And that makes me very sad. And if Kevin Costner did nothing for the rest of his career, but make sports movies, that would honestly be okay with me. Although I've not seen a single minute of Yellowstone, so I can't comment on that. Yeah. That's my number two is Ron Shelton's Bull Durham, which I think is 1988. You would be correct. 
Okay, so I made one minor adjustment. I'm sorry. This is why we should compare lists before we record, but then again, maybe not. No, no, no. But I had more than five available, so yes. <laughs> My two is going to go kind of a, it's not, no, it is. It's it's definitely a sports movie. Go with Dodgeball, A True Underdog Story from 2004. <laughs> number one, everybody roots for the underdog. I, so first, Vince Vaughn is probably one of the best like comedic actors of, of our generation, I think. Absolutely. Um, he get like, when you watch the outtakes, so much of his dialogue is improv. It is, it is oh, ridiculous. Really? And it's just that he is that naturally, you know, gifted with comedy. And then, you know, surround, you know, so the premise of the story you know he's gonna lose his, his gym because because ben stiller's amazing super gym super across gym. The street, you know so and 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 vince just has this average joe's gym that's gonna get you know bought out by globo gym and they, they that so he's got this god bless him he's i love <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> justin long i love justin long he is so cute but he comes up with the idea of entering a dodgeball contest to win the money to save the gym. So they put this dodgeball team together. <laughs> Coached by Rip Torn, Patches O'Houlihan. <laughs> and God bless them. You know, they're just they're just a bunch of people who they in some strange way became this beautiful family of misfits. And you got and again, it is it is a one hundred percent true underdog story. And inevitably, you know, of course, Globo Gym enters the the dodgeball co competition and puts together a super team, and and chaos ensues, and it's and it's, it comes down to the the last golden ball of the dodgeball. But I I love it. So it is it's the underdog story, and it's about people finding whatever they have inside themselves, some special gift that they have that that allows them to prevail that brings brings out the best in them and and it's about bringing people together in in a, in a strange way so <laughs> and it's just damn funny it's just a damn funny movie so i don't know i can't i'm just laugh and probably the, the icing on the cake <laughs> is jason bateman that's pepper the commentator oh that's right that's right <laughs> the tournament it's oh my god i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> is uh, is dodgeball uh, part of the what's his Judd Apatow universe of of things? I can't I don't remember like Seth Rogen or being in that movie, but but some it, other people that carry over, you know, that that kind of contemporary group of yeah, that was in the eighties. There's this like the the Apatow pack of you know present day. Um, I just happened to watch Anchorman last night for the fun of it. And there, you know, there's another hilariously comedic Vince Vaughn turn at the rumble where Rick kills someone with a trident still to me is one of the funniest things in the world. But I, I completely echo your sentiments on, on Vince Vaughn. And I, and I always like Ben Stiller playing the comedic bad guy too. Although, you know, when you go down the, Oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the, model movie Zoolander Derek Zoolander where you want to cheer for him but he just you know <laughs> he does some amazing things on camera in the, yeah. in the name of comedy and almost okay. almost slapstick you know yeah well he produced it so Ben Stiller produced Dodgeball yes Dodgeball so that was that's my number <laughs> so I finally I found a an honorable mention and it's actually I'm doing a tie and I'm going to pull in the dark side of sports and I'm going to share the two movies is Stop at Nothing the Lance Armstrong story and Icarus these are both documentary films and it's basically about doping in cycling but more so the Lance Armstrong documentary is infuriating and liberating at the same time when you take a look at what this fella did over years the lying and the manipulation and the intimidation and it just 
it just is crazy. And you want, if you ever, however you felt about Lance Armstrong before you watched this movie, you're going to want to, you know, throw a pie at him and tomatoes and lettuce and anything that, you know, could pelt or otherwise disturb his universe because my God, it's, uh, it's infuriating. And the companion to that is this documentary Icarus, which won the Academy Award for best feature documentary, maybe seven or eight years ago. And this journalist kind of gets in with the Russian doctor that oversaw a lot of the doping that the Russian athletes were doing 2004 Olympics, maybe. But he undergoes, like he does the stuff that the the Russian athletes and, and Lance Armstrong had done. So it's an interesting tale of son of, you know, an average man going in and, and experiencing what this is like. And it's, it's quite telling as well. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to pull in some of the dark stuff and talk about Lance Armstrong. So that tie is my honorable mention for this show. Um, my honorable mention <clears throat> is not dark. It's actually uplifting. I'm going to go, my honorable mention is going to be Remember the Titans from 2000. So yeah, that's all kind of this, when the integration of, of high school in Virginia and he is basically the first African-American coach at this public school comes in and, you know, one of the first things he does is, you know, they're, they're loading the buses for, for, for training camp and all the whites one bus and all the African-American students are on another bus and he makes them all mix up defense on one bus, offense on the other. Mm -hmm. And they have to room together and they have to get to know each other. And wouldn't you know it, they learn how to work together <laughs> and they learn how to be friends together. And they learn a lot about the racial tensions of, of, the, of what, you know, what African-Americans were experiencing in the seventies. So there was it's it so in that way it's kind of it's 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 not a comedy it's not heartfelt it's a very it's very serious but the other reason i love this movie is i love these these kids that play these players they have the greatest personalities uh -huh. so you've got you got a, a young ryan hurst who i adore love 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 him you got donald Faison, who you know Coolness. yeah he's such a doll kip pardue who plays sunshine of course now you know we jokingly sometimes called David Sunshine because he has the long blonde hair. And then you have the young Ryan Gosling, who's such a doll. He's so, he's so young. <laughs> so it's funny looking back, this movie's 23 years old, but there's, there's there, you can see the talent in, in all these different, all these different people in the cast. Yeah. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, what I love about it is it's triumph because of the, the will to win and the will to do what it takes to, to pull a team together and to get over your, you know, get over yourself but then also the sacrifice because Will Patton, you know, Yost makes the sacrifice at the end. He loses his mm -hmm. shot because he believes in the team and he believes in, in Denzel, you know, Boone. So yeah, my honorable mention, remember the Titans 2000. Well, that is a great, great movie. Yeah. I've, I've, that's one I can watch over and over again. If I, it's like, you know, remember dad used to watch Top Gun twice a night for like two weeks straight. I yeah, could, yeah. if I watch Remember the Titans, I'm going to have to go back and watch it again from the beginning. And yeah. I'm with you, you know, I feel the same way that you do about Remember the Titans and the, the younger cast and kind of where they take that story. It's kind of the same way that I feel about Cobra Kai and the young cast that they brought into that show, which I yeah. miss desperately, by the way, this writer's strike is, is, putting the anticipation of the sixth and final season of Cobra Kai, like making me a little crazy, but that's neither here nor there. I can't make that pitch coach. Sweet <laughs> sunshine. Okay. Uh, All right. We're here. We're at number one. Yep. This is probably going to surprise a lot of people. And perhaps a lot of people have not seen this movie, in which case shame on you because, Oh my God, it's amazing. I'm going with the Robert town written Billy Crudup starring Without Limits, the uh, one of the two movies made about the Olympic athlete Steve Prefontaine from Oregon, the long distance runner who had talent and an ego to match it. But what I love so much about this movie is the relationship between Billy Crudup and the coach, which in this film is played by Donald Sutherland. Um, I think 
I think Billy Crudup can do anything, by the way. And I'm so glad he did not get cast in Titanic, that he turned it down, because it gave him space to do all this other stuff. Just incredible personal movies. And and this movie is is fantastic. It, it starts with his high school and, you know, his goals for running and what it was like to grow up in Oregon. And he just had such, he commanded the track in those days and you could not beat him. But the Olympics wound up not working out for, for, for Steve. And then before he was able to kind of get his shit together and go back, he was killed in a car accident. So it was a, a, a tragic story, but, but, but Billy Crudup inhabits this space, this character, this person in a way that I don't think, you know, we could do the top five actors who really became their characters list. And I, I think Billy Crudup would, would make that list. And so, yeah, this movie stays with me hardcore. And I, I just, I'm so, I'm so inspired by it, even when he's acting like a complete and total asshole, because he, he had quite the ego when he was in high school and then his, his days at, at Oregon, but, but his teammates straighten him out and his coach straightens him out, but it, it's, it's not enough because he does not ever meddle and then, you know, tragically dies in this car accident. But nonetheless, if you have not seen Without Limits, you've got to add that to your playlist because it's, it is fantastic. And I just, yeah. I have not seen that. I saw the Prefontaine Jared Leto mm -hmm. movie, so I will have to put that <clears throat> on my on my watch list. Yeah, the Jared Leto film is is pretty good as well. Yeah, and they were actually sort of companion releases. I don't know like why two studios decide to release uh, films about Steve Prefontaine in roughly the same the same year. It's not like. It's not like a lot of people even remember who Steve Prefontaine was, not to yeah. take away from his greatness, of course, but, you know, both movies are great, but I think that Without Limits eclipses the Prefontaine because of, of Crudup's uh, performance. All right. I will do that. I will, I will watch it. Um, okay. Well, my number one is Vision Quest. So oh, yeah. It was, it was your number. What was, it was your number oh. It was my number one. So he is just, I mean, for, for somebody like who loves geeks, he is, he may be a jock, but the dude is, he is such a geek. He is so, he is super he is so awkward. Yes. Super awkward. And the awkwardness of, you know, when he's, you know, trying to woo <laughs> this, this woman, Linda Fiorentino, who's, you know, renting the basement essentially because his dad felt sorry for her. Anyway, but the story between the two of those and like she doesn't hold him back. It, if mm -hmm. anything, she inspires him on his vision quest. Yeah. Uh, so there's the love story aspect of it, but then there's the the friendship that he has with <laughs> with Kutch. Oh, Kutch. <laughs> I I love Mike. I I, I love Mike. Michael Michael Schofling. Kutch, if if for no other reason to watch this movie, because he also knows he's not a great wrestler, but he sticks with his best friend, mm -hmm. uh, his team, pretends to be a, a Native American, but he's but he's not. Um, but he has a really hard life. Uh, but he, you know, the spirit to you know overcome adversity is just as much with him as it is with. With, I mean, and Matthew Modine doesn't necessarily face an adversity. He has a goal. He's going to, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I love the way, I love the friendship of, of Kutch and Loudon, Loudon because of what they do for each other. Mm -hmm. but down to the very end, Matthew Modine has to, you know, the Loudon Swain has to lose that last little bit of weight and he's getting ready to weigh in and Kutch whispers in his ear, what does he say? To the point where oh, heck, heck, the underwear goes to every little bit. I'm yep. breathing all of the air out of my body to get and and there and he makes it. So yeah, great, great supporting cast all around. Best soundtrack of the 80s, bar none, hands bar down. None. You know, you if you when you have the go-go singing on the backup of a song, right? Yeah, seriously. So I I love it. I love it so much. And I can watch I could do like I could play dad with uh, vision quest and watch it over and over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, and one of my top, I, I did not put this enough. I want to go back and redo my top five favorite movie kisses. Cause the first kiss between 
between Loudon and and Carla. Yeah, it's in it's in silhouette, and the they're at yeah. the fire, and they're, they're they're walking around, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, it's yep. crazy. And I, you know, I the the story in the hotel where Otto is talking about the Pele thing on TV. Mm-hmm. I took the night off from cooking and I come in to watch your wrestling match. Like that is so heartfelt for me. Yeah. If you are not crying at the end of that scene, then you do not have a heart. I'm sorry. I so, agree. All yeah. right. This was Andy. This is a great list. Why don't you recap? And then I will recap. Okay. So my honorable mention was remember the Titans. And then from five to one, Rocky two, Fox catcher, Tim cup, dodgeball and number one vision quest i had two wrestling movies on mine hmm. okay yeah and you know i'm realizing i do not have a basketball movie on my list i don't or know do I- maybe that- so- what's that there's just so many sports <laughs> yeah my honorable mention mention is the dark combo of stop at nothing and icarus and then five to one is rocky vision quest the replacements bull durham and without limits so maybe this is why I don't really watch a whole lot of contemporary professional sports, because why do you need to watch that when you have these amazing movies? But you live in Kansas City, so you have that little cutie, Patrick, what's his name? Pah- Mahomes? And his name is Travis Kelsey, who is rumored to be dating Taylor Swift. I'm just like, that's the oddest combination I've ever mm-hmm. heard of. Taylor Swift has dated some odd She's had odd couples. Yes. Uh, Taylor Swift and Tom Hiddleston, like Swifty and Loki. No, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but Tom Hiddleston is not quite the dancer that he thinks he is, in spite of what Moji Video has to say. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, that's our that's our episode and a little bit of editorial commentary there at the end. Sorry for any Swifty fans out there, but honestly, if you're Taylor Swift fan and you're listening to this show I don't know what to say sorry (laughs) just a thing for Annie Pruitt I'm Chris McKee and thank you as always for tuning in to another inclusively opinionated episode (laughs) of the top five podcast and we will catch up with you on the flip side